in the sense that we have nine partners and almost 200 employees. We don't have studios. I don't have people who work exclusively for me. And the partnership itself, we lead the practice, but it's very non-hierarchical. It's very collegial. Every Monday, we come together and we have lunch for two hours. And our director of marketing comes in and she talks about projects that perhaps we should go after or institutions that want to hire us. And very calmly over lunch, uh, we debate amongst ourselves, should the office pursue the commission? And then who amongst us should pursue the commission? We always work in pairs, a management partner and a design partner. And we will recombine these two partners depending on who's either most interested, who has the best experience, and who has the ability at that moment in time to really give 100%. And that's how we decide uh, which projects to go after. There are very few firms that are like us. Most are led by singular individuals that are international design firms, and we are a collaborative or a collective. And I just wanna show how rich the architectural outcomes can be from this different type of model of an office where uh, design ideas and design culture are paramount rather than the leadership of a single individual. My partners and I push and pull on each, on each other all the time. We work separately, we work together. We think it's actually making a much more impactful architecture and I hope to show that. <laughs> I think what's most, the seminal projects are the ones that are the first projects. So we are a generalist architectural practice that provides full service, meaning we actually do our own drawings most of the time and we supervise construction most of the time. So we do full service. My way, right by the sand. revisit the buildings we've made, learn what mistakes we've made, and learn how not to make them in the future. But like most architects, I think we can do it better. Right now, uh, our firm and most architects do the process, what I'll call in an analog way. We return, we observe, we give questionnaires out, we might measure mechanical systems and see how they're performing in terms of reducing carbon, but it is a kind of, um, not an exact science. What ENIAD is doing right now, we've developed our own in-house applied computing group. We actually now hire on staff computer scientists, programmers. And what we're developing is a robust digital programming platform that will allow us, before we start a project, to complete uh, analysis on how human beings might be working, how cities might be working. And it exists all the way through the project, helping us in design, but then post-occupancy, using smartphones and using API-based software and RFID monitors in the buildings we make, it's constantly pulling data in real time and sending it to us. So that is a much more accurate way. And we think all architects should be heading down this road of having more robust digital tools to see how buildings are performing after they leave. And this uh, software program that we're developing, it'll probably be ready um, to be used on a widespread basis in about 24 months from now. We're very, very excited about it. Well, let me talk first not about any ad, but what about I see 
in the immediate future for architecture. And my view is conditioned that not only am I an architect in an international design firm, but I was also the president of AIA New York, which is uh, like a guild of architects in New York City. Um, but it's also linked to the National Institution of Architects, and I learned a lot. In the next decade, there will be tremendous opportunity for architecture, but there will be also tremendous damage coming. And I want, personally, the architects of the world to wake up and understand that our profession is finally going to be disrupted, really by a combination of changes in industry, digital technology, and the way projects are delivered. Um, so I'm worried for the architect in general, and I think it is time for all of us to rethink our role in society and try to reposition ourselves as the great problem solvers in society and thereby actually get new types of commissions that aren't necessarily immediately building commissions but position ourselves to solve problems, whether it's for institutions or corporations or governments. I think the way architects think, design thinking, the world really needs right now. But what's also happening is uh, with increased robustness of digital tools, many of the things that the architect does today, the computer will do tomorrow. And I expect, I hope it's not true, that about a third of the world's architects will go out of business in the next decade if they don't change the way they think and do business. So that's the, that's the highlight there. In terms of ENIAD, uh, I want us to continue to change the definition of what an architect does and constantly lead. The example of having a robust applied computing group in our office and building our own software, we think architects uh, should do that as well. I'd also increasingly like us to be compensated, not just for making buildings, but for the quality of our intellectual property. Many other industries, you are compensated very well because of how big your ideas are. In architecture, we have historically given away the big ideas and gotten paid just for making the building. And I think we have to change that if, if we are to survive. But I really want to say that the, world, the power of architecture, many of us have forgotten how incredible it is to change outcomes, to change ecologies, to change environments, to optimize human performance. And if we can only reclaim that and get compensated for that, I really think the architect's stature in society can return to a much higher level and we can make the world a much better place. And I'm hoping all architects of the world join me in this. I want to talk about urbanism in general. About 75% of our projects are in cities. But we work in other ecosystems that are equally complex and important. So we also do a lot of our work in universities, which have some of the complexities of fitting in. Um, and we uh, do a good deal of work um, making new mixed use projects, particularly in, in China. Our approach is always first social. Um, fitting in, uh, we believe, really should come first and foremost from us expressing an architecture that is of this time. And we believe we exist on a continuum with the whole history of architecture. So it's important to us to come up with an architecture urbanistically that continues and moves forward the project of architecture and doesn't look like a project that could have been done 100 years ago. So that's how we push things. But how we actually fit into the urbanism is by deeply studying uh, urbanistically patterns of social use in our sites, in our cities. We work mostly for institutions that are not for profit. They're trying to do good in the world. And a lot of what we do to fit in urbanistically is make sure that those institutions touch the public realm uh, with a lot of surface area. Um, our work is really about bringing institutions to the street. And increasingly, we ask our institutions to make outdoor social spaces for the city. And that's a way to fit in as well. 
municipalities, just like here in Milan or New York City or in Shanghai, China, don't have enough money to actually invest in public realm space making. Increasingly, it is the institutions that have to make the public realm. And lastly, in terms of fitting in, we really like to analyze the history of architecture where we're working and not quote things, but in terms of construction and materials, use them, but try to teach them new things. So whether we're working in India or New York City or Latin America, to think about the history of architecture, for example, screen walls in India, walls that hide the sun but allow you to see through. How can we use those but interpret them anew? And that's a way to fit in with the continuum of history in an urban environment. My way, right by the sand. to make beautiful buildings that make people you know, wonder at how great it is to be human. Uh, that is our baseline condition, and we like to measure that just by finding out if people in cities and people who use the buildings love the buildings. But the greatest parameters are on the social and on the ecological. On the ecological, I think you understand in terms of sustainability that we really do want to measure if a building is performing well, if it's repairing the environment. So that's something that we're interested in measuring more of. And again, measuring in the future with more robust digital tools. But in particular, we care about the social. We really think that architecture conditions human social interactions. And increasingly in our portfolio, since we work for institutions, institutional culture. We really want to measure, is the institution performing better at its mission? Right? Is the institution connecting to people to advance their cause? And those are things also that we plan to measure digitally and collect data in real time post-occupancy in the very near future. Grazie, ciao Milano. Mi dispiace non posso parlare in italiano, e così voglio dire, sapere, Fabene in English. We have a long history in our profession of talking only to architects seriously. But if our profession wants to thrive, the public really has to understand very simply the power of architecture to change things. And in particular with your film series, which believe it or not, I saw this for the first time tonight. I was a little scared. Thank you very much. It's a great, it's a great movie. But with the film series, the magazine is quite serious, but the film series can be put out there so that the public increasingly values architecture. And I think it's just very, very important. So uh, tonight the topic is one, nine, more, which I will try to explain to you uh, in introducing Ennead Architects. And we're going to start with one. The concept of one uh, in architecture is very profound. So for those of you who are familiar with this book, The Fountainhead, which is very popular and made into movies with Cary Grant, the notion of the historic, uh, I'm sorry, of the heroic individual architect has been really overblown and championed uh, too much in our culture. And you know, to give you an example of one, right, we know, we know this image, and uh, I'm a great admirer of Frank Gehry and his architecture, but I also believe, knowing people he's worked with, that it takes more than Frank Gehry to make a Frank Gehry building. But also, the heroic architect increasingly in, in the recent past and even now is propelled by personal artistic vision, which I think is very important, but it's not the only thing that matters. And I'm hoping now um, with firms like Ennead and there are others like us and the forward momentum that we will ask more of architecture than just being a personal expression. So here's the history lesson that I want to briefly talk to you about and, and blame you Italians for a terrible thing that happened. So if you don't know, the very first architect we know about is called Imhotep who was the funerary architect of the uh, ancient Egyptians. And Imhotep was not a heroic individual. History has called Imhotep that. But he was a very robust, critical problem solver. 
and he managed many different aspects of the work and collaborated with many people to invent ways to move giant pieces of stone. He decided, along with others, what goats to sacrifice to what gods. He was what I call a complete architect. If you fast forward, you Italians are, are responsible for this guy, Brunelleschi. And the history of architecture, in my mind, was unbroken from ancient Egypt to Brunelleschi. And Brunelleschi was not noble born. Um, I did research. He actually had a partner. But what Brunelleschi was, um, that I most admire, was a problem solver who would never say no. The architect can't do that. So I'm going to go there. What happened, Brunelleschi was still alive. Uh, this guy was born Alberti. And for me, this is the great schism in architecture. This is when the myth of the heroic individual was born. Uh, Alberti uh, was Nobel born. He was beautiful compared to Brunelleschi, very handsome, dressed very well. But what Alberti did uh, in Florence post Brunelleschi is he moved away. He didn't really want to hold the contracts of the stonecutters. Brunelleschi did. He didn't want to really work and get his hands dirty to try to figure things out. He wanted to write treatises on proportion and beauty. And increasingly, he was concerned with the facades. And this, to me, I know Brunelleschi was not responsible for the facade of the Duomo in Firenze. I'm just putting that there because, as you know, he was the only one who solved the problem of the dome. Compare that to uh, Alberti. And for me, there's a big difference between those two types of architectural minds. And I lament the fact that for many years, we forgot about Brunelleschi in the sense of being one of our gods of architecture. And the lineage of Alberti continued on to this recent period, at least, where we have these heroic individuals pursuing personal artistic design freedom and bringing these pieces of architecture around the globe without necessarily working to understand local culture, without necessarily working to see architecture as something that improves society and ecologies, and most importantly, without admitting that collaboration is where architecture can find its greatest strength. We believe, and I think it's true for those of you who are architects, you'll agree with me, if you have a stool, it needs the three legs. And these are the three legs that we believe are equal. And unlike star architecture firms, we are a design first firm, but we recognize how important technical architecture is, as well as management. And we see creativity in all three of these. And even when we work around the globe, we try, as much as possible, not to associate with architects, but to do the technical drawings ourselves. Because we, as we saw in the video, really believe that architecture is in the making, not in the drawing. And this translates to a brain. At ENEAD, we try to find people who, in a single mind, can synthesize all three of these driving forces behind architecture. We do specialize within the firm. I'm a design partner. I have management partners. We have technical directors. But each one of us is coded to deeply understand the interrelationship between the technical, between management and design. Next comes the notion of nine. We are now called ENIAD. We used to be called James Stewart Polshek and Partnership. Jim, St uh, Jim Polshek on the left uh, was my mentor. Uh, he was the dean of Columbia University's architecture school. And he just won in the United States uh, this year the uh, gold medal from the AIA, which is just below the Pritzker Prize. What's unusual about ENIAD came about when he began to retire. 
nine partners in a very short decade were made to inherit the firm. And what's unusual about that as an international design firm is we're all close in age. There's only about 10 years between the youngest partner and the oldest partner. Um, and we all, it's important, own about the same amount of the business. So there is no hero here. There is no boss. There is no CEO. There is no president. We run this as a collaborative, a collective. There are problems with that. It's sometimes hard to make decisions. We meet and insist on meeting every Monday for lunch to decide the direction of the firm. And we debate with each other. And sometimes we fight with each other. And it is a very successful design culture. It's a bit competitive. When one of my design partners puts something on the wall and I walk past it and I say to myself, I wish I had done that, I go back to my desk and try harder. The same thing on technical, the same thing on management. What's interesting you saw in the movie is none of us specialize in any building type. And we do every project with at least two partners, a design partner and a management partner. Now, but we don't always work together. Right now, I'll have seven jobs that I'm designing. And I'll be working with four other partners. Some of them I haven't worked with for four years. And what's so great about the process is they've gone out into the world, tried new things. We come back together. Same thing with our staff. Our staff goes out, works on certain projects. They're not dedicated to any partner. And we formulate a new team. It's not the most efficient because everybody is new to working with, with each other again. But it is the most creative because everybody brings something new. And a partner of mine might be working on a museum. I might be working on a law school. And we'll suddenly come together and find out technologies or materials of new ways of doing things that can be applied yet to a third typology. And what it allows us to do is to rapidly invent new things. architects have to pursue beauty and have to make buildings that are of our time and of our aspirations and create wonder in people. But at any ad, there's this other component here. And actually, it's the dominant component. We really believe that we've lost too much attention that, of the power of architecture as an agent that can improve things. We believe architecture can improve society. We believe it can improve ecologies. And I'll say two nuanced things. In ecologies, we understand sustainability. I think we're all understanding that it is a moral imperative that the work we all do must not continue to exploit the planet. But at any ad, we're also very interested in social ecologies. I believe us architects and, our, and, and us as a nation have to say, of course, there are many factors that have led to this deterioration of society in the United States. But one of them is that we lost the aspiration to make great public spaces in America and to fund them so that common ground in our society was always available. So I think architecture also, and urbanism, has a role to play in social ecologies to keep nation cultures healthy. And of course, we really believe on the impact of architecture to shape our emotions, to shape our psychology, and to shape how we interact. And in particular, for our firm, where 80% of our work is institutional, how architecture can optimize institutions and therefore allow them to deliver their mission more effectively. And there's a notion of more. And more is this incredible staff. I think you saw in the movie, nobody leaves. Like we, 
we can't get rid of people. People are, are, have been here for 20 and 30 years. I don't think it's because we pay them well. Uh, I don't think it's because we have good coffee. I think it's because they really value their um, contributions, that we have a, a design process that allows the most junior person to raise her hand and say, I have this idea. And if it's a great idea, we believe it should win. Um, but also because of the types of projects we work on. Uh, I think people stay here because they believe they're making the world better by doing these institutional buildings that are, that are trying to really improve society. So um, one of my partners thinks of us like New York in the 1950s, the art scene in the 1950s with de Kooning and Rothko and all those others going out and drinking and talking about color and paint and those types of things. I don't like it because it's still these individuals. If you've read this comic or seen an X-Men movie, I think this is what any ad is. And what we promote is the brand X-Men, not my name and not my partner's names. And if you see those movies, you know that each movie, it's a different group of X-Men that come together, right? And that's how we do every project. It's a whole new group optimized to solve the design problem. Of course, everybody wants to be Wolverine, you know, Wolverine now. I always wanted to be uh, Dr. X. And we bring this team together, and I, this I, I really want to linger on. This is only one of the problems facing our planet, facing our culture, facing humanism. There are so many structural problems in the world right now. And it is really time for the architect to reclaim her position as the entity collaboratively that can attack these problems. It's really important to me, if we're all gonna survive, that we stop as architects waiting for a commission and we begin to do research to define the commission and then we actually go out and make the commission happen, then design the building. Because our brains, the way we've been trained, we have not deployed this critical design thinking broadly enough. And we're hoping that our firm, you in this audience, architects moving forward, will step out of the very narrow box you're in and really say to the world, we can solve this. The architects can solve this. I believe that we really can. So we have an office in New York and in Shanghai. Uh, as I said, in total, about 20, uh, 200 people, almost 200 people. Uh, the blue is everywhere we've made a building or are making a building. And this is one of my favorite quotes. I don't know if you know Winston Churchill. He has a lot of really good quotes. I leave it up to a politician to say, in, in a nutshell, what I think is the most profound one sentence about architecture. We shape our buildings. Thereafter, they shape us. Love it. But I'm a little bit critical of it because it's passive. It's in the passive voice. Maybe Churchill's saying, that's a bad building. I live in a bad building, so now I'm going to be bad. That is probably what he's saying, but I think at any ad, this is more of our motto, and we'll really come to our real motto. But we shape our buildings to shape ourselves. Architecture, we feel, is an act of optimism, and it should be deployed to improve things, and to improve things both ecologically, socially, culturally. So as we start every project, there are a couple of things we ask, and you saw in the movie. If architecture is so powerful to shape us as a society, then let's do the analysis and decide what we should change, what we should make better. And this is my personal motto. The thing is not the thing. And what I mean by that is, this is the same building. On the left is the image that would be published on the cover of an architecture magazine, right? On the right is really what we care about. Allora basta, ma voglio dire, di Bruno. Don't be Alberti. <laughs>